Thank you. Wow. So, I don't often interview people on stage, uh, so forgive me if I feel as if I'm a little bit out of character, but uh, this is an exceptional situation for me. I'm interviewing someone who I've looked up to for many years, uh, someone who represented sort of a gold standard for the kind of documentary making that I aspired to do. And, uh, you know, there's not many people for whom you could say they are stars of documentary, um, certainly not many British ones, and Nick falls squarely into that elite category. I, I, I want to sort of start by um, trying to define, I mean, I'm sure most of you know his work, uh, but as a recap, as it were, I'd like to start by trying to define what it is that you do in, when you're in your sort of, your most quintessentially Nick Broomfield mode, if you like, because mm. you've worked in a lot of different uh, ways, genres, fiction, more traditional documentary, but there's definitely a kind of Nick Broomfield um, style that people identify you with. How, how would you characterize it? Gosh, um, I, I guess I've always looked to other people to characterize it. I just am always kind of concerned about the next film, which always seems to be going uh, with great difficulty. Uh, I think filmmaking is so much about getting through problems and trying to come up with solutions. And every film always seems to be harder than the last, and that never seems to change. So I, I don't know how I would characterize it. It's kind of like uh, an endless struggle with great benefits of satisfaction when you get to the end, I think. I had an idea you might answer like that. Oh. And uh, so luckily I've come prepared. Ah. Um, we have a clip, and, and before we show, I'll just mention uh, what it is from uh, Biggie and Tupac. A film, what, what year did you make that? Do you remember? Um, Talking I think about 2002. 2002, mm. uh, which is an investigation of, what would you say? Uh, it's sort of an investigation of, well, in a sense the LAPD, whether they did the hit on Biggie. Uh, so it's an examination of the LAPD, uh, who I've been angling to do something on for years. Uh, and also this very complex relationship between uh, Biggie and Tupac. So, uh, and for me, I think, you know, I was, I was prepping the clips for this session and, and I, I had a few options to go with, but for me, this, there's a, there is a kind of quintessential um, Nick Broomfield uh, way of approaching material and I think this kind of exemplifies it and this comes towards the end of the film at the moment when you finally come uh, face to face with Suge Knight who was the head of Death Row Records that's right, right. and who uh, who you'd been angling to get an interview with for some time so you're in the prison trying to find him so should we join the clip at that point the warden suggested we try Suge Knight's cell block cell block 15 15 control staff please it was extraordinary to suddenly be in Suge Knight's cell block. Wow. We all looked around in amazement. To this table right here. Well, they got a with them, so. Yeah. Yeah. And then we saw him at the far end on the phone. Maybe I'll go and ask him. He's on the other phone now. I guess. I'll ask him. Shall I? No, I, I don't mind asking him. I don't mind asking him. I'll just put up, I'll, I'll just put this down and ask him. What do you think? I'll wait till he gets off, I'll go ask him. All right. I guess he's hurt his leg. Yeah, that's what he's put. What? Hey. 
things I could say before. Like I was, you know, I was, I was just that I don't want to be involved in the stuff where it's negative stuff. Hi, how do you do? I need to talk to you. Oh, OK, sorry. I don't know what the warden said, but Suge Knight agreed to do a short interview. I wondered what Suge Knight would want to talk about in this, his first filmed interview at Mule Creek Prison. He's been in for five years. I heard he was on the warpath for Snoop Dogg. Hi. Oh, OK. My cameraman seemed a bit jittery. It was like he wasn't there, dreaming of some tropical island in a better world somewhere else. I noticed he seemed to be looking around for a possible route of escape. Let me talk to you one more time. Okay. We're doing a benefit for some kids out there, too. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? I don't know if you talked to anybody from my office. Do you ever talk to anybody from my yeah. office? Yeah, spoke to Reggie. Right, you yeah. talked to Reggie. I mean, I don't have to do this. No, I know you don't. I do this because you know we doing a piece positive for the kids. Okay. So, so I want there's it's no slander and funny stuff. It's positive. What, what you want to ask me before we get on? Well, that I said I, you know, I gathered that you didn't really want to talk very much about Tupac. Mm -hmm. I agreed to no slander and funny stuff, and to ask Shug Knight about his message to the kids. And so, what is the special? message you would like to send to the kids. What a weird way we earn a living. <laughs> Do you remember the message to the kids? It was complete BS, <laughs> what I remember. Um, it was a funny situation, though. I mean, I think when you make documentaries, you're endlessly in these situations that no scriptwriter could write. And uh, we were unable to, you know, Suge Knight had turned us down for an interview, and Death Row Records were threatening us and wanted to know which hotel I was staying in and all the rest of it. And the camera person I normally used refused to come because you had to put your name in the visitor's book of the prison and didn't want to put her Los Angeles address in there. So I borrowed somebody who had never shot. I turned, they said, I filmed in a prison, but then it was an empty prison. So when they got there, they were like totally traumatized because we had to sign a form saying if we were taken as hostages, they could shoot our knees out. <laughs> um, and then the superintendent obviously really disliked Suge Knight and decided he was just going to ambush him. And as Suge Knight wanted to leave the prison, he needed to have the superintendent on side. So he was blackmailed into doing this interview. So we had just arrived in Suge Knight's cell block without Suge Knight knowing we were coming. And I have the impression that the warden is, is nervous to approach Suge Knight as well. Yeah, I think there was an element of that. And so you're like two kids at a disco saying, you know, you go up and ask her to dance. No, you go up. And, and, and then finally you both go up at the same time. Uh, yeah. It was... Yeah. Um, so what I take from that, is, which for me is a sort of a lesson of doc making that's quite profound, which is that sometimes the interview is the least interesting yeah. part of the encounter. And, and it's everything around the interview that is, re is most revealing. Uh, and I think when I was trying to identify what the Nick Broomfield style that most people know is, it's something to do with that and, and, a, and a widening of the frame and an awareness that you need to uh, capture the whole exchange insofar as possible. Yes, I think because we're always dealing with reality, which is often so extreme, if you have a very narrow focus on the interview or the ostensible subject, uh, you miss out on all the best stuff. And that really happened to me when Joan Churchill and I co-directed a film about Lily Tomlin. And it was a kind of really bad film at the end of it. And it was really bad because we resisted filming all the funny stuff that was happening uh, with her, and, uh, which was much funnier, I thought, than the show. 
And then at the end of it, uh, she sued us anyway for $11 million, I think. And so I thought, well, we've got all these wonderful after-dinner stories about Lily Tomlin and how ridiculous it was making this film. But, and the film would have been so much better, but we, they weren't in the film. So I then decided to kind of widen it and put it in. Uh, I want to go back to the beginning. A lot of people... Um ask me, uh, you know, how do you get into documentary filmmaking? You're in the unique, virtually unique position of, of sort of getting to write your own ticket in terms of what you, what you seem to be able to get to cover what you want to cover. You, get, you have theatrically released documentaries. How did, you, how did you get started? Well, I just um, borrowed a camera. I was at Cardiff University. I borrowed a camera from, you know, it was very keen on rugby up there and they liked to film their tries. So the Rugby Society had a camera, which I borrowed. And I did a film in Liverpool with a friend of mine called Peter Archard. I didn't know, really know what I was doing. It was a little wind-up camera. Um, and then I edited it. And I sort of discovered in the process, which was fairly torturous, actually, that I loved making films, that there was a, a pleasure I got at mainly making the film work. I mean, it, it was, I have to say, 18 minutes long. And it took me a year and a half to edit it. For any of you who might think your editing is going badly... Um, and I think I was close to a nervous breakdown at the end of it. Um, so, but it gave me the knowledge that I wanted to make films. And I think, really, for so many filmmakers, people kind of waste so much time applying for money and stuff at the beginning and going through the torture of pitching. When it's, you know, you can borrow a camera, you can go out and find out whether you really want to torture yourself for a couple of years and do a film or not, you know, and it's an acquired taste, I think. So um, I learned a lot on that, probably the most on that first film. You went to the National Film School and um, you you've, uh, in some way fell under the influence of a man called Colin Young, who's perhaps not widely known outside the docs world. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us who he is and, and what influence he had, if any, on, on you and your work? Well, I think Colin Young is like the godfather of documentary. He's sort of um, very wise, and he uh, had an enormous influence on me and Kim Longinotto, Molly Deneen, lots of other filmmakers who came out of there. His love is really ethnographic filmmaking, and he would train people in crews of two to go and film. He said, you know, you never really need more than a crew of two. And that was with film, and, uh, you know. And he would teach us how to shoot uh, kind of cinema verite films. And he, he also, of course, introduced me to Joan Churchill, who I made many films with. So I was, you know. He also had a wonderful enthusiasm, romance, I think, and passion for film, which was so infectious, and uh, I think he's very underappreciated. Is he still he had a alive? Massive effect. He's still alive. He'd be in his 90s. I think he's in his late 80s, but yeah, I, I, he was the founder of the National Film School, and I think just an amazing, amazing man. So but going back to, to uh, then, or a little after, <clears throat> you were making films often with Joan Churchill, who was your cinematographer, and the films of that time um, are... are quite different in character to the one we just saw. Mm. They are, in a way, well, as you said, ethnographic in, a, in the sense of being a uh, sort of detached presentation of raw reality. Mm. Um, we have a clip from one called Soldier Girls, which I think... Would you want to quickly mention ha ha how you came to make that one and what it was? Uh, we were... Joan and I went on a kind of literally a trip across America, driving in a car, looking for different subjects, and we came across a postcard of these girls with enormous grins on their faces, bayoneting these straw dummies of a body or something. And we, it was such a funny postcard. We both thought, wow, this would make a great film about, you know, women undergoing basic training, and that's what we did. We went to Fort Gordon in Georgia. And you just said, can we make a film? And they said, okay, fine. There was no access. It was very easy to do it. I mean, I remember we actually had to go to the Pentagon to meet with someone called Major Schleiger, who I thought was going to be this formidable. And I went dressed like this. And Major Schleiger was a kind of Californian blonde 
with, I remember, she said, it, she had two chains on. One said, Foxy Lady, and the other said, Take me, I'm easy. And <laughs> she was like, You want to film in Fort Gordon? You know, fine, go and film, you know. Okay. So let's take a look at the clip from Soldier Girls. <laughs> Young lady, squat first. Why <laughs> you people keep moving around? No, I'm sorry. That was the purpose of covering. Fourteen, sorry. Fifteen, sorry. Please pay so, attention. Is it still funny, Private Tutton? Tutton? Get that thumb down along the seam of that trouser. You still think that it is funny, Private Tutton? No, sorry. Well, get that head squared on your shoulders. Say something, Tootin. <sighs> Say something! <sighs> now you can stand there all damn day. It don't bother us, private. <sighs> well, private Tootin, we are waiting on you. The whole battalion is waiting on you. Sergeant, Private Toon requests permission to cover, recover. Request permission to carry on. You're already recovered. You're already recovered, young lady. Oh, my tongue! You get your head squared, you keep it squared. Now, sound off! Sergeant! Private Toon requests permission to carry on. Get back here, Toon. Back here. No matter what little pains, what little aches you got, you keep them to yourself. They do not influence any of my military formations. You understand me, Private? Yes, Sergeant. You start acting like a soldier and looking like one, not crying all over the damn place and getting a little case of the ass when somebody gets on you about something, Private. I wasn't crying because of that, Sergeant. If you're crying because of the pain, you stifle that too. I'm not crying because then of the pain Then what either. is it, Tootin? Nothing, I just cried. Sergeant! Sergeant! You keep squinting your little eyes at me, young lady, and I'll have you back in the dirt. I don't need your little sarcasm, and I don't want it. You do not display any emotion in uniform, Private. Any emotion. You understand me? Yes, Sergeant. And then when I tell you to move out somewhere, young lady, it's at a double time. You do not walk back to me or to any other NCO in this company when you are called. You understand that, Tootin? Yes, Sergeant. So when I tell you to join my platoon, all I ever better see is those little feet of yours moving as quick as they can in that direction. You understand that, Private? Yes, Sergeant. Well, we'll find out. Move, young lady. I have to say, um, I love those early films. Um, mm. There's another one you did around that time called Tattooed Tears, in which yeah. you got access to a uh, California Youth Authority mm. facility. Mm. And they're, they're very immersive, and they're much more about you, you kind of bedding into an enclosed, almost cult-like community. Yeah. Is it, how, did you enjoy making them? Is there anything about that way of working that you miss? Well, I, I just have to say, looking at that clip, mm. I think, you know, that clip was really about the brilliance of Joan Churchill, who's just such an amazing cinematographer, who really created that scene, I think, by just holding on that face in such a remarkable way. Um, and I have to say, you know, when I started, I fancied myself as a great cinematographer, but she was frankly so much better than I was that I was relegated to sound. Uh, <laughs> Mm, although I did think the panting was quite well recorded too, but um, it is very well recorded. Yeah, and the there's a sort of he he hawks up some phlegm at the end. Yeah, that was good Nicely too. Nicely covered. Of course, he was on a radio mic, so I couldn't take a <laughs> lot of credit for that. But yeah, so those early films were very much about. I felt you know I met Joan through 
Colin Young, and I think, you know, she had shot the series called The American Family. So Joan had shot, like, every day for a year, just pumping film through that camera. So she could do things with the camera that, you know, most people couldn't do, and she kind of introduced me to this area of filmmaking that was very new to me. You know, like, shooting those films is very difficult. You know, you don't do anything twice. You, you've got to be totally into... And, and have almost a sixth sense as to what's happening. So, you know, all those early films, Sadhu Tears, Juvenile Liaison, you know, Soldier Girls, were done in that way. And then I think, you know, Lily Tomlin was kind of a watershed, which was, it was a bad film. Uh, you know, Joan and I disagreed about how the film was going to be done. You know, Joan was... Joan's family doctor this incredibly wonderful doctor called Elsie Georgie had introduced us to Lily Tomlin. So Joan had a lot of loyalty to Elsie Georgie, which I didn't share. So I was all for butchering Lily Tomlin when she started to annoy us all enormously. But Joan stayed loyal, which was, of course, what she should have done. But when the film was no good, I just thought, I've got to... I, I feel my arm is behind my back, you know, tied up and... I want to tell a different story. And when Driving Me Crazy came along, I just experimented with a different way of making films. And then I don't think Driving Me Crazy necessarily was a you know, wonderful film. But when I came to the leader, I thought, I, was, I will employ that technique. And I think it worked really well in the leader. Well, and you're referring, of course, to the leader, his driver, and the driver's yeah. wife, about Eugene Tablanche. But we have a clip, in fact, from the first one you mentioned, Driving Me Crazy, and I disagree with you. I think it is a wonderful film. Oh, well, thank you. And, and I, I, it's a kind of ur text, uh, if I can use that pompous phrase, <laughs> for uh, a certain kind of participatory filmmaking in which you're forced into telling a meta story that is more interesting, arguably, mm. than the story you've been tasked with telling. And it feels almost like a sort of, uh, you know, it's a 2001 moment where the cavemen pick up the bone or whatever it is they do. And you think, oh, hang on, there's a whole different approach to uh, narrative that we can employ here. You'd been brought on to tell the story, it's kind of a weird story to begin with, of, of a German crooner who was, who was bringing a, a company of New York-based black singers and dancers yeah. to Germany, right? And you were following the auditioning and the process of producing the show, is that correct? That's right, yeah. So, uh, so this is, we're going to show a clip from that, and, and then I think that it's fairly... Uh, well, we'll talk about it afterwards. Right. So we see that clip? Yes. New York, January. I discover that the budget of $1.6 million has been slashed to 300000 We are reduced to a crew of two, and the financiers are now disagreeing about the film they want. VCL in Germany would still like to make the real-life fame, but they can't get support from their two other partners, Virgin or Telly Munchen. Andrew Brownsberg, the producer on the film, who has previously made such films as Being There, The Postman Always Rings Twice and Macbeth, still assumes the financiers will eventually come up with the additional $1.3 million needed. Andrew has found a writer called Joe Hindi, and together they have enlarged the original fame idea to include an imaginary film producer called Max. What about our writer? We need a... No, we need a... No, no, I don't. He's not drinking either. Oh, no, that's a very bad omen. OK. Shall I tell you the idea? OK. There's a producer called Max we never see who's hired you, Nick Broomfield, because he's seen your work and because he's a very close friend of Andre Heller's. And they, Andre suggested to Max the idea of shooting a documentary around his preparing a show. And Max thought it would be a good idea, but what he really wanted to do is something much bigger, a real film, a big film around this show that his great friend Andre Heller is putting on in the Munich Opera House. Now, At this point, I have severe London, reservations like about the entire project. Party, the only way I agree to stay on is if I can film everything, including our discussions about the kind of film we are making. As a writer, the, the idea of creation is always a transposition of reality. And how far does one transpose reality 
to its fictional elements and keep the truth to oneself. Characters, circumstance. Part of the idea that Andrew and Joe have come up with is that Joe, who is also an actor, will perform as a character in our film, acting as a kind of bridge between the dramatic and documentary elements. The whole thing sounds crazy to me. Transposition of reality, because in fact that, that's what we would struggle with. And I know that sounds probably as vague as the rest, but it does summarize, in a sense, what we're talking about. You talk, if that's not too abstract and too esoteric, that's an interesting point to make as we're just discussing it. Does that make sense? Well, um... Do you understand a word he said? <laughs> did you? Maybe no, you did. I didn't. Oh, I, guess. <laughs> I didn't understand a word right. I, uh, Joe Hindi, I noticed, didn't get many writing credits after this. <laughs> no. Uh, it was very weird, wasn't it? Making the... Yeah, the whole, just the whole situation you found yourself in. Um, at what point did you decide that, uh, okay, I'm just going to tell the story behind the story? And, 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 and how difficult was it to sort of wrap your head around that? Well, I should say that Andrew Brownsburg is an amazing character. Um, he called himself Old Silvertongue with good reason, which is he would... He's the English producer. He's the, the English team. producer, who I, who I love, and who had done all these big films with Andy Warhol and with uh, Polanski. He's great friends with, Malek, with Polanski. So anyway, he had got all these people to give him all this money, and he talked them all into it, and then they all decided to pull their money out. Uh, and I said, well, I'm going to go back home, and you know, when he sorted out Andrew... Let's do something. And he was like, but we've still got some money left. We've still got 500000 or something. We're staying in the best hotel in New York. What are you going to do for the next three months? Anyway, let's just make anything. Let's just make an experimental film. And I said, well, Andrew, um, I can't think of what to do, except you know, you're the most interesting character here at the moment. And you're the only person who knows what's going on. I'm going to have to put you in the film and this other film that you're talking about that I don't understand. I don't understand Joe Hindi. You know, what are we doing with Joe Hindi? He said, oh, put him in the film too. So we, we then did this, probably the most ex expensive student film ever, <laughs> which was driving me crazy, which was a complete experiment. I was kind of amazed that it kind of even vaguely worked, but it was, creatively incredibly liberating because it showed a whole different... Because I think there's this thing that Fred Wiseman says, which is if you trust the ideas on the edge of your mind, there's, those are the ideas to follow. You know, don't take the obvious ones. And this was definitely an idea on the edge of the mind. And it kind of worked, you know, so... Were you aware of any precedent for that kind of filmmaking? The only film I'd really scene like that was a film by a Canadian filmmaker called Mike Rubo. Oh, Waiting which, for Fidel. Waiting for Fidel, which I just thought was kind of, well, the first half of the film is brilliant, which is, I mean, you have to see the film Waiting, Waiting for Fidel. I, I can't describe it. It's or, about some Canadians who go yeah. to uh, Cuba to meet Fidel Castro, and one is a sort of dyed-in-the-wool socialist and another is a capitalist, so they're constantly arguing the yeah. merits of socialism, and Fidel's supposed to show up, and then he, he basically never turns up. Fidel has no interest in seeing them at all. He puts them in some hacienda on the outskirts of Havana, where they all just stew in their own juice. Yeah. And the guy who's paying for the film can't understand how Mike Rubo shot hundreds of feet of film. And they're nowhere nearer to Fidel. And well, what, what are you doing with my money? You're shooting. So they're having a terrible fight. The socialist is composing all these imaginary questions that he's going to ask Fidel if he, of course, he never meets him. And the only person who gets invited is the premier of Finland or something, who's a very small little man. He's like about five foot two. And he's got to borrow the dinner jacket of the sound recordist, who is six foot four. So one of the best scenes is, is him trying to, you know, they put scotch tape and stuff all over the, you know, he gets sent off and he reports back about Fidel and he was meeting with Aldenar or somebody from East Germany. And, but it's all a wonderful comedy, but in the process you really learn a lot about Cuba, um, miraculously. And then the second half of the film he sort of tries to do more of a proper film. So, 
so, so this sort of opened up a template for you of working where you, you, you were a protagonist in the story. And, and then you had a very fertile period of, of making uh, documentaries in this way. You mentioned um, your South African one, The Leader, His Driver, and The Driver's Wife. Right. There was also one called Alien Warnos, The Selling of a Serial Killer. Um, can you set that up? To, to tell us a little bit about how you came to that story. Well, I had originally been offered a series about serial killers, uh, which I didn't want to do, but the one person who was interesting was Eileen in those serial killers, because for a start, it was a woman killing men. The others were all men killing women. And also, when I called her lawyer up to see about, he immediately wanted $30,000 to interview her. And I thought, wow, this is... Uh, you know, I thought there's a son of Sam Law. You're not allowed to make money, so I thought, well, this is a this is an interesting idea, and of course I flew over there, and you know, Steve Glazer, the lawyer, was somebody who didn't even have a fax machine, who had only represented marijuana growers before in Florida, who is now handling this enormous capital case, and it, you know, the characters were just so strong that it it was you know, wacky film, but also a portrait of, it became the first portrait of Eileen, mm -hmm. who was somebody I had a long relationship with then from, until she was executed about 14 years later. And about a kind of rather parasitic set of figures who had clustered around her. Uh, yeah, around her, exactly. We've got a short clip from that first film. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at that. All right, here's the contract. I'll just uh, have her sign it. The trip to the prison had gone well. <laughs> Lee Warnos was going to keep to her no-contest guilty plea for the trial at Pasco the following week, and Stephen Arlene were to be paid 2500 apiece. Yeah, clear as night, sir. What's Davy Crockett doing on a $100 bill? Here I am paying Arlene her money <laughs> in advance in exchange for a proper interview and additional What'd information. What'd you say, uh, $1,000 on sun-up in the fourth race at Belmont? <laughs> Steve then got concerned about his payment. She wants to know what? She wants to know when I was going to get paid. So I told her, you know, I, I trust her to, I trust you guys that you'll pay me when you, when are you going to pay me? When are we going to pay you? Yeah. Um, well, originally we were going to pay half the money up front. Oh, you want to just pay me all the way at the end? No problem with me. See, I have trust in my fellow person. I mean, it's just a little glimpse of, of that one, but it brings up something, that I, I suppose, a question that is begged when watching all these, this kind of, stories in which you have uh, told a story behind what you appear to be telling, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, how, you know, does one run the risk of burning bridges when filming processes that, I'm assuming Steve probably thought that would not be in the film. I mean, yeah, maybe. And, and, and with regard to the, <laughs> the, the, warden, the warden, the prisoner who said, don't film this, and then you continued filming, Mm. And, and, and Joe Hindi in Driving Me Crazy, who uh, I would say when I'd finished watching that, I thought I was, he, he seemed to be on the edge of nervous collapse. And, and, and so what, what is, to what extent are you aware of burning bridges uh, in the process of making the films and afterwards? Well, I always think those kind of films are like, you have an allegiance with an imaginary audience that you're going to just do a diary of what really happens. One way or another, you're going to tell what really happens. And so you do that. You know, it doesn't really matter terribly. I mean, obviously, sometimes you say to the people, I'm kind of doing a diary of this process, of this film. I don't know what I'm going to put in. I don't know what I'm going to leave out. But I'm just going to document everything. So, and I might arrive with the camera running. So, And did Steve... Uh did Steve appear to know that he was that you were filming his tr the transactions number one and number two? Did he particularly care? No, I mean Steve was a kind of um, desperate, wonderful guy. Mm. So he didn't hippie have any money. Was a th what a hippie burnout? Was he was phrase. definitely yeah. He was a hippie who lived in a in a teepee in Micanopy, I think was the line, which is what he was doing. Uh, and so, you know, he, he kind of loved us. 
because um, we always fed him. We took him breakfast, lunch, and dinner and entertained him during the film. Um, and so he was kind of along for the ride. But at the same time, he was doing something very strange with Eileen. It wasn't that I withheld what I thought he was doing was, was great. If, if he'd said to you in that scene, Nick, I want you to stop filming this bit, what would you have done? No, I would have said no, you know, that's not our deal. And if, if it, the tempo of like, you either stop or, or we're done? You know, I think you get a very good sense of people. Mm. And Steve was never going to do that. You know, because I think the relationship you have with the people you film, in the main, is a very amusing relationship. You know, I always had very amusing crews with me. You know, people who were just fun to hang out with. Yeah. So, you know, Steve liked us. It wasn't like he was going to get, you know, it, and it was on the level in which he was doing it. I mean, you know, Steve was a prankster and a funny guy, and so he wasn't going to say, stop filming. And there's a sense, I suppose, in which once you've already started filming, maybe over a day or, or a few weeks, they're invested in the relationship, and, and they, they are keen for it to work as well. I think the, you know, what you don't see here is that there was a born-again Christian mother who adopted Eileen, and she was much more mercenary. And when I confronted her about the fact that I thought she was using Eileen and she was getting all this money and I felt it was completely wrong, we had a big argument, but I didn't mind if it was terminal because I. And you put that on. That was in the film, film as well, and I remember yeah. when I that was the first of your films that I ever saw. It was 1993 in New York, and I remember thinking, "Wow, this is different to any other film I've ever seen." The the film the, they seem to have the sound recorders getting into arguments with the <laughs> contributors. <laughs> that, I never knew you could do that. Uh, we, <laughs> They, uh, we have a clip from, you did a follow-up film, I don't know what, 10 or 15 oh, years yeah. later, mm. which um, in some ways is more layered and nuanced because by then you developed a bit of a relationship with, of some sort with uh, Aileen Warnos. Mm. Uh, we have a, uh, a clip from that which I think it's worth taking a look at. So sh shall we look at that? Yeah. Hi, Aileen. You know, I already told you everything, so, you know, you just go ahead and ask me questions, and if I want to answer them, I'll answer them, okay? Okay. So, so I, I, I guess, you know, I was just wondering how you're going to be, you know, at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Are you prepared? I'm prepared. I'm all right. I'm all right with it. And how... I'm all right with it, but, like I said, remember, it tells... Let them know that I know that the cops knew who I was after Richard Mallory died. I left prints everywhere and they covered it up and let me kill the rest of those guys to turn me into a serial killer. I know they did because I was no professional serial killer or anything, or murderer or whatever you want to call it, you know. It wasn't special at so, what I was doing. I, mean, how, I did how, some sloppy work, you know. And I left how prints. have you prepared yourself for tomorrow morning? I'm all right with it. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Hey, I was tortured at BCI. They had, they had the intercom on in the room, and they kept lying that it wasn't on, and they were using sonic pressure on my head since 1997. Sonic pressure. And every time I was trying to write something, I, they, and I, I think they had some kind of eye in the cell, I'm not sure, but every time I started writing something, it went up higher. So I'm thinking that probably had the TV rigged. The TV or the mirror or something was rigged. They got a huge satellite on the compound. After they put the huge satellite on the compound, it could have been either rigged to the TV set or the mirror or something. Because the electrician, when he put the mirror on the wall, he said, doesn't that look like a computer? The back of it, and they stuck it to the wall. But you're OK now. I'm OK. I'm OK. God is going to be there. Jesus Christ is going to be there, all the angels and everything. 
and you know whatever whatever's on the beyond i think it's going to be more like star trek beaming me up into a space vehicle man then i move on recolonize to another planet or whatever but it's whatever's the beyond i know it's going to be good because i didn't do anything as wrong as they said i did the right thing and i saved a lot of people's butts from getting hurt and raped and killed too so are you saying that you killed in self-defense or in, in cold blood what do you what do you because you, you've changed your story. I'm just trying to... What are you talking about? Change story on what? No, about whether it was self-defense or not. I'm not going to say... It, you know, I'm not going to get in depth about my cases, Nick. I'm on my way to the chamber. Nothing's stopping it. You can believe it or you don't have to believe it. That's up to you, man. Put a big question mark on your film. Just before we came here, we met with your, with your mother, Diane. You met with my brother and Diane? Your, I could your give mother. It. Oh, mother. My, my mother, Diane, let me tell you something. She plopped me out of her belly, left me with my grandparents, and we never knew her. So tell that damn whore I could give a fuck if she even had me. She had me and left to Texas. And my mom, my dad, Barry, Keith, Lori, all of us never saw her ever again, except at funerals. My mom's funeral, my dad's funeral, and my brother's funeral. And if she's at mine, I'd be spitting on her. I care less. I don't give a damn about that whore. Well, she, she asked I don't you, know her. I never she, even knew her. She asked you for your forgiveness. She can go to hell. She doesn't have any of my forgiveness. I don't, know, I don't even know her. Don't even want to know her. Any thoughts on that one? <laughs> uh, probably too many. Yeah. That was a painful, painful film. Um, I, I don't know really where to start on that one. I mean, it was uh, a devastating film. For, for what reason? Well, I, you know, I, I was very fond of Eileen, and I thought she was very badly treated. She clearly had lost her mind, and she was going to be executed the next day. So, you know, it was, you know I, I was in correspondence with her for probably, you know, 14 years or something. And um, it was also a record, you know, it was a very brutal prison. The guards were very vengeful. They, they, they were very, I mean, you saw the attitude of the guard in the interview there. You know, they were... I think, you know, she was the butt of their jokes, and it was just, it was one of those things that makes you not believe in a justice system. Um, you know, I kind of naively believed that we could learn from what had happened to Eileen, which, you know, the rest of the film was very much about the incredible sexual abuse that she had had as a kid. She'd been raped by her, I think, her father, as well as her grandfather. Um, and her brother, and had been truant from, from school for most, you know, for years and years on end, and somehow the social services were unaware. And I kind of naively, naively thought, oh well, you know, people will use that textbook, this case, to like look into it as to how this could happen. But, it, you know, of course that didn't happen. Um, you know, and you know, Jeb Bush was running for re-election. He was determined to execute her. So it was just very devastating. I remember, you know, it was just one of those moments in your career when you're really upset. Uh, <clears throat> were you, I mean, you had a, you'd kept in, you'd corresponded with her out of a sense of uh, this is a good subject and I will potentially make a follow-up. No, I liked her. I liked her, and we had a connection. Mm. It was very funny. The first time we went to film her, um, Steve had driven us down, and Steve you know, normally re represented marijuana growers. So he had several joints in this air-conditioned vehicle, uh, very strong ones. He was driving. Um, <laughs> by the time we got to wherever it was, where Eileen was in prison, we were all much the worse for wear. 
And we actually managed to get ourselves arrested trying to do a tracking shot around the institution, which was a crazy thing to do, given that there were guys with machine guns all around it. And they then strip-searched us and sort of took the car to pieces looking. I don't know what they were looking for. So by the time we interviewed Eileen, the rumor of our arrest had gone around the institution. And she was convinced that we were a rock and roll band that were performing that night in the prison. I kept saying, no, Eileen, we're here for you. We're just here to interview you. But she was very amused by us. We were obviously a source of great amusement for most of the prison that this had happened. The TV crew had been strip searched. So, you know, she just thought we were great. And that was the basis of our relationship. You know, and obviously Eileen had a lot of time to write letters. Mm -hmm. So she would write these incredibly long 15-page letters with little drawings all over them. You know, she's quite... And she was actually pretty... She did really quite amazing drawings some of which I've still got. And I would send the odd little kind of slightly mean postcard back. And, but I did try and get her new legal representation with a group of you know, feminist lawyers in New York who were very together and very much wanted to represent her. But she just distrusted them, wouldn't have anything to do with them. So you know, I suppose that was part of the disappointment. Then I testified on her behalf as a witness at the final you know, before execution, that hadn't really <coughs> gone anywhere. So I was quite emotionally involved in her story, much more than most of these stories, you know. Uh, you, we, we actually had another clip, I think because of the time factor, we should probably uh, talk uh -huh. about your latest project, which okay. is about um, Whitney Houston. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to t tell us how you came to... That's what you're basically... That's what we're plugging, in a way. Um, oh, right, OK. Uh, how, how did you come to make a film about, about Whitney Houston? Um, I, I just think she is, you know, an ama obviously an amazing woman who, uh, for a long time, was the most talented, most beautiful, <clears throat> most successful ever, you know, female artist. Um, who was then trashed and judged horrifically at the end of her life. And I, not knowing very much, went into it just to... I felt that enough time had, had elapsed to have a look and see whether there was a different story to her life than the one that everyone had sort of been telling. Uh, at the risk of asking a tacky question, What's been your most? This is going to be a good one. <laughs> what's been your? <laughs> what's been your most commercially successful film? Probably Whitney. Isn't it too early? To, I mean, I'm sure it will be. <laughs> well, it's not uh, been released yet. <laughs> okay, um, he's very smart, but what he doesn't know, Louis. So you've already sold it. It's already of, sold. Yeah. yeah. Except well, that I've, I asked you why you I've managed why you to. Say I that? have managed to go so over budget on the film. Before Whitney, which was your most? Uh, oh, probably Kurt and Courtney. Mm. Well, let's take... We've got the trailer from uh, Whitney. Mm. The ti actual title is Whitney, Can I Be Me? Is it? What, I haven't got it right, have I? What is the actual... Can title? I Be Me? Can I Be Me? Mm. So let's see the trailer from uh, Can I Be Me? How would I like to be remembered? You know, it probably doesn't even matter anyway because they're going to remember me how they want to remember me anyway. <laughs> They had a vision for a pop artist. They wanted to present her as the princess. I did not go into the studio wanting to make a pop album. She was closer to her dad. But Whitney had the career that her mother always wanted. So I go. Whitney was from the hood. Bobby was street. They just had a chemistry that worked for them. I'll think of you. Robin loved her, cared for her, was a friend to her. The way Success doesn't change you. Fame does. Whitney was at the top of the charts. She had seven consecutive number one records. She was everywhere. <laughs> her favorite saying was, can I be me? I have made all these people happy. 
And I still can't be me. Can I be me? Whitney Houston actually died from a broken heart. You gotta know who you are before you step into this business. You probably wind up being somebody that you don't even like. If she were an artist today, she probably would still be here. It's a terrific film, uh, very moving. And, um, and it, uh, we started by talking about Nick Broomfield films, and I did it in a slightly reductive way of right. kind of defining it around having a... Um, slightly, I hope I can... Not, don't take it amiss if I say it's a shambolic or, or a slightly quixotic figure with his boom pole getting into scrapes. This is not in that... You should take up a boom pole. <laughs> I'll, I will think about that. Right. Okay. I really wouldn't know one end of the boom pole from the other, is the truth. Um, this is not that kind of film at no. all. H how, what dictated your approach in this one? Well, I think... Um, let me say, first of all, you know, not every... The wonderful BBC that we both are sort of employed by, uh, were, who co-commissioned the film... Um, I think initially um, wanted more of me in it, believe it or not. Uh, but I felt that the material was so strong and that Whitney's story was so complicated um, that it had to be her story. And for a long time, the film didn't work. For a very long time. I mean, I, I was really in despair at one point because it, see, it was a kind of so what kind of film for a long time. And then... Mark Hofflin, who cut the film, said, what we really need to do is put Whitney in the film. We need to hear, hear her voice. We need to be with her emotion. We need to be with her, her presence from one end of the film to the other. That's the way it will be, you know, really emotional and moving, which took a, you know, was absolutely the right thing to do, but it took us another seven months to do it. And part of that equation was to remove me completely from it, which was actually a wonderful exercise. I was very happy to do that. And, you know, it, and the film started to really work. So it just wasn't relevant to this film at all. Had there been an early pass, an early cut, yeah. in which there was more of you there doing was. what? Sort of going, arriving at houses and... Exactly, you know, being immediately confronted in Newark that I was not allowed to film and that kind of thing and interviewing some of the neighbors and, you know, it was a bit about the rival film in it, which was a kind of boring thing. Mm. So, you know, this is, this I felt was a opportunity to tell a very emotional story from a very personal point of view from her point of view, where, I mean, you know, and for me as a filmmaker, it was remarkable making it about somebody who is no longer with us and to become so emotionally moved by her story. I mean, I found myself, her and Eileen were the two other two films I've made where I felt really emotionally kind of distraught, you know. Um, so it was a remarkable experience editing the film. And there was obviously this incredible footage that Rudy Dollis, the co-director, had, had shot that was so intimate and, and telling about Whitney. Um, and it was great. I mean, I think his, his footage obviously makes an enormous contribution to the film. And it is a beautiful film. Uh, we actually um, are at that point in the evening when we are going to take some questions oh. from the audience, I think. Uh, so, what do we do? Bring up the lights, and, and then if you have a, um, a question for Nick, um, please raise your hand, and there are roaming um, people with boom poles. 
or otherwise. <laughs> and don't be shy. Do we have any, we, we have not a single hand up. We've actually bored everyone <laughs> into a catatonic state. We have a brave soul down here. Should we take that question from the um, gentleman with the beard? Nick. The, the microphone is not working. Why don't you just shout it and I'll repeat yeah, it? Yeah, we're all. If you like. Or, or, unless, Nick, you've brought your kit, that would be. <laughs> 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 Nick, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but it's not that positive, but you mentioned the despair that you faced or felt when making the, the film. What, what takes you through that stage in filmmaking? Was it something that you experienced often? Did everyone hear the question? Can, no, okay. Do you Did you hear the question? I, I the question was, uh, Nick had mentioned the despair he sometimes feels in making films. Mm. Uh, what takes you through that? Is that correct? Well, because I think filmmaking is all about problem solving. It's all about getting through the problem and in getting through the problem you learn about I think that's how you learn on making films which is so exciting so uh, I mean yes you know it's just not obviously you have to be honest with yourself because often a film isn't working um, you know and we had umpteen screenings of the film some of which were you know people would come up with devastating criticisms and I think part of being a filmmaker is to grow a slightly thick skin. I mean, some of the criticisms are always, you know, some of the criticisms are stupid, and some of them are pretty accurate. Or sometimes you can just find something in the criticisms that are worth listening to. But yes, Whitney didn't work for a very long time. And um, yeah, we were all trying, just trying to find a way through. It's not like you can just throw your hands up in despair. Are you sort of agnostic on whether you should be in a film or not? You're not particularly invested in the idea of being no, on screen? No, I'm not at all. Would you, you know, rather not? I, I, don't, I don't... I think if you have some personal uh, investment in the story, I think that's fine, or you could even just do voiceover or whatever. Um, I think, you know, when I first put myself in the film, I was very amused by the whole thing, and it was, it was fun to do. Um, and then I started getting more worried when commissioning editors were requesting me to be in the film. I thought then it was decidedly less fun. Mm. It was much more fun when they were saying to my producer, try and keep him behind the camera. Uh, you know, and then, of course, you come up with some delightful trick. Because I think you know, a lot of filmmaking for me is... Well, there is a humor in it, I think. There has to be a humor in it. And I, I think I just got tired. I finally got just tired of myself, uh, which took a remarkably long time. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just like I didn't feel I had a lot more that I was amusing myself with, least of all anybody else. Do you think you've moved on from that? Not necessarily. I mean, you, you know, maybe in the short term. Uh, it would be convenient for me if you had moved on, but in a way, uh, <laughs> leaving the field rather open. Um, should we have another question? But no pressure. Uh, do you have another, another question uh, for Nick? Somewhere over there? Uh, th have you ever thought of a collaboration? Who? Oh. Have you well, I've offered of to interview him next year, so <laughs> that's... <laughs> Very kindly. Have you ever thought of a collaboration with me? I don't even know how that would work. That's quite a bit. Yeah, well, how would we... We could take on um, Trump together or something. <laughs> uh, another well, question... That clearly isn't going very far. <laughs> I don't know really how to deal with that one. Over here. Hello? I was just wondering if there's any uh, personality trait or aspect of someone that draws you to them particularly and makes you think they'd be a good contributor? I, I think it's probably more just uh, are you interested enough as a filmmaker to stay with it for a year or however long it takes you uh, and believe that there's a good story there? You know, are there enough 
is there enough in it that excites you? I think it's really the, the question you ask yourself, or I ask myself at the beginning. It's like, is there something here that intrigues me and makes me curious that I don't n really know very much about? Uh, you, you've talked... I think that answered the question. Did that answer your question? Yes. You've talked disparagingly about one of your um, fiction films, mm. Diamond Skulls, a thriller, mm. um, which I think you consider not totally successful. Is that correct? That would be an understatement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it, so I can't oh. comment. But I just wonder, among your documentaries, are you aware of some being better than others? Yeah, I think you definitely know the ones that don't really work. Which ones are those? Mm. <laughs> well, you know, well, obviously, Lily Tomlin, I don't think, worked. Um, Sarah Palin was very painful. Um... I'm just trying to think of... Why was the Palin one painful? I don't want to slag off all my work. No, because you've got collaborators. <laughs> Tricky question. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want to keep selling my box. I set. sort of think... Um, <laughs> I think uh, sometimes we learn more from failure than success. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, I certainly learned... Well, Diamond Skulls was a disaster. Um, it got very well reviewed in the New York Times. Did it? Mm. My God. Yeah. Would you mind sending me the review? Oh, I right. just remember looking at that film and as a filmmaker, I think it's the only time when I just wanted to, I wanted to slide off my chair into a deep hole. And <clears throat> I couldn't believe that I had anything to do with the film. But I made all the mistakes you're not supposed to do as a fiction director. I you know, had an affair with the leading lady and <laughs> I had a lot of fun on the film, but then... <laughs> Then you deal with the reality of what of your mischief, which was very painful. Um, and I also, I think also I learned from it when I did Ghosts and Haditha. Um, I learned a lot to keep the spontaneity of documentary, kind of try and use real people, make something dynamic happen. I think the sterility of shooting a conventional feature film I just couldn't do. You know, having 80 people waiting around for you to say something, uh, I found intimidating and not, you know, it wasn't creative. Some people are great at that. But I think there are other ways of making those films. And I was, I was very happy with Haditha. I thought that worked as a piece of drama and as a piece of emotion. Um, and I think you can work that way, you know, the equipment is so much more flexible now. You don't have to have a big Panavision camera and, and be stuck. In, you know, I just found making that film that I was being controlled by the camera rather than me controlling the ca camera. I felt completely controlled. Um, and I just didn't make a good film. Hmm. Another question? Oh, there's quite a few to choose from now. Oh, here we go. Right at the back, go on then. I just want to say, I would be a doctor if it wasn't for you. I've stumbled across your film online totally randomly, and I wouldn't be a doctor, and I wouldn't be going to university. Your film basically changed my life. Oh. Oh. Bless you. Yeah, I think Eileen were kind of, you know how it is, we're kind of odd creatures, you know, we're like odd animals, and I think Eileen and I liked each other from the moment we met, for no ostensible reason, I mean, we couldn't really be much more different, but we had a real connection, and you know, that happens sometimes when you're doing these films, for no real reason, you have a, a real powerful connection with somebody that... I, obviously, you need to build on if you feel it, you know. 
I mean, you must have experienced that mm. a lot. It's, uh, and, but in fact, it's, you make so many films, it's, you, 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 you meet people, you, there's an urge to keep in touch with them. It's not always realistic. It's, it's a part of mm. what I experienced. But there are a few that there you There are a few. I sometimes imagine as well, are there people you've documented who you've felt, okay, if they ever came to my neck of the woods, I'd have them over and you know, they could, we could hang out and play Parcheesi? I don't know how to play Parcheesi, but... <laughs> Sometimes in my head, I sort of imagine that there's more friendliness there, and then when I imagine them, I think, like, would I be comfortable uh, having them over and, 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 and hanging out and them sort of staying the night? And, and, and I think, like, hang on, that's... Well, maybe that's know. going too far. Yeah, maybe I... Maybe <laughs> I a bit too, too much information. <laughs> Should we do another question? Over here? Um, is there any subject that you wish you'd covered before the subject would have died or I know obviously looking at the, the Whitney you wish I, I assume you would have been able to wish you could hear her account but is there anyone, anyone in particular that you wish you could have heard their account yeah there are, there are a couple well more than a couple I sort of like always wanted to do a film on The Clash and I sort of started going on tour with them and they you know for various reasons didn't happen but I thought they were so amazing um I nearly did a film on Diana, but I, you know, I didn't do it when I should have done it. And um, you know, years and years ago, when I was doing um, Too White for Me about the black musician Chico, um, I met Nelson Mandela with Chico, and um, Chico had not only been having an affair with Winnie. But he was also renting his house to the ANC just when he came, when Mandela came out of prison. And, but Nelson Mandela himself was paying Chico the rent. So we'd go to Shell House and Nelson Mandela, and they had a kind of very jokey relationship, the two of them. Um, not at all the Nelson Mandela you see. And I just thought, I mean, I, I could have, you know, killed myself for not doing that film because it was just there. It was just such a, it would have been a really easy one to have done. I mean, I had complete, and I just completely, completely missed it. And also I missed um, Brenda Fassi, who was also, ama you know, this amazing South African musician who was around then and I just didn't, you know. So there are a lot of films I've missed. Theresa May. Is that what you just said, Theresa May? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard her singing voice. <laughs> Did you say Theresa May? Oh. <laughs> we got time for one... You know, we're supposed to be out of here five minutes ago. Should we, we do one more quick one, and then, and then that's it, I'm afraid. Uh, but who, who will that fall to? Someone said, me, me, me. Go on. Okay, this, I'm going to have to shout. Is this working? Oh, yeah. Um, first off, thank you very much for your contribution to the world of documentary. It transformed my life. And some years ago, I was reading a book where you went through each film and the process of making it. And at the end of the book, the person that was uh, interviewing you said, do you realise that every single film you've described as the most torturous <laughs> <laughs> of your career... So that actually was inspiration for me to carry on and become a documentary filmmaker because you appeared to suffer constantly. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, which is the easiest film that you've ever made? Wow. Um, and why? Oh, I did a film uh, which was just a monologue that Spalding Gray did called Monster in a Box. Um, and that was very easy because it was just, you know, three or four big 35 cameras trundling up and down, filming, Spalding doing it. The one thing I had to do was get into the box to direct the cameras. And I had sort of introduced Spalding at the beginning and they'd locked me on the stage so I couldn't get to the box. So in fact, they shot the entire film without any direction from me. <laughs> and. Uh, I just edited it. That was definitely the easiest. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.